This is our session four, FOSS, blockchain, and AI. Um, the buzzwords are everywhere. Everyone's doing it. Companies that have not been traditional generators of free and open source software are also now major stakeholders and contributors to FOSS, blockchain, and AI projects. And uh, companies that have built empires in proprietary software are doing AI development. Now, we will discuss why FOSS is essential to blockchain AI and the legal issues as they arise. Our first session is going to be um, about Hyperledger and the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, how they join forces to drive mass adoption of blockchain technology. We have with us James Wog. He started Video in 2016 to help artists get sponsored without compromising the integrity of their work. In collaboration with Trevor Overman, creator of the multidimensional token structure, he's now building create.xyz to facilitate coordination with greater accountability. He's going to talk about what does this mean for developers? How are these open source communities working together? James, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. So I'm James. I've been running the Hyperledger NYC community for a little over a year now, and I just volunteered doing that because it's a great way to meet awesome people working on open source technology. Um, and I love these three buzzwords, open source, blockchain, and AI. Uh, unfortunately, we're focused on the first two, not all three. Couldn't jam all three into one talk. Um, but we're talking about Hyperledger, which is an open source community for developing frameworks and tools that help businesses uh, create their own blockchains. So. First, I'm just going to give you a high-level overview of what Hyperledger is, because uh, there's a lot of misconception about uh, the, the name itself, which has the word ledger in it, because uh, Hyperledger is not actually a ledger. It's not a blockchain or a cryptocurrency. Um, so it's just a growing community of developers working on projects uh, hosted by the Linux Foundation. And these projects are open source frameworks and tools that other developers can use to build their own blockchains. So the governance model is a technical steering committee which is elected every year. Um, and, and that's kind of how the decision making process uh, uh, operates. So you have people from members that get elected and then decide whether projects and uh, you know, different uh, repositories get merged into the overall code base. Um, so here's a breakdown of all 10 projects. You got five frameworks and five tools. I'll go into a few of these in detail, um, but the most important ones are the, the frameworks. You'll see Fabric and Sawtooth are the modular frameworks that you can use to build your own blockchain. Indy can be used with those frameworks to implement identity uh, frameworks and, and systems. Um, and, and Iroha is for, for mobile application uh, focused developers. And, and then uh, you've got Burrow, which is uh, something I'll focus on later in the talk, but that's the permissionable smart contract interpreter um, contributed by Monax. Um, and then all those tools down there you see, uh, Composer, Cello, Explorer, um, Quilt, and Caliper, those are, those are also being contributed in an open source environment and facilitating the, the development of the frameworks along with uh, actual implementations. Um, so, Here's just a taste of the governing board members of Hyperledger. Uh, you see American Express, Baidu, so big corporations, but also contributing members who are also corporations like Intel, IBM, um, Oracle, uh, et cetera. Um, and and uh, there's actually been, in the lifetime of all 10 projects, uh, 729 unique code contributors representing more than 150 organizations. And total, there's 277 Hyperledger members today. So here's just a few stats to throw at you to showcase the momentum we've built over the past few years. Uh, there's, two, like I said, 277 members, a ton of contributors, uh, all the projects, over 88,000 commits have been made, 11.2 uh, million lines of code. Uh, and one of the meetups, Hyperledger NYC, uh, is part of this growing community of, of over 140 groups worldwide. Um, so today I thought I'd share a recent development within the Hyperledger and Ethereum communities, uh, which is the associate membership formed October 1st uh, between Hyperledger and the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. 
And so as a developer, I'm going to tell you what that means for people building. But uh, you know, I, I want to bring it back to the legal considerations uh, for, for blockchain uh, in a business context. So um, just to give you an idea of the difference between enterprise, which is a public blockchain or a public network, uh, ver versus uh, the enterprise Ethereum stack, uh, you can see here the application layer is, is totally separate from like what is the public Ethereum uh, implementation. And then uh, you can see the blue, blue stuff on these two slides is separate. So that's, that's also, a, a, it's an additional uh, implementation that provides uh, features that permission networks utilize. So uh, really the only thing that's core to the protocol uh, is that yellow stuff, which is from the yellow paper uh, uh, from years ago. Uh, but you can add on trusted execution, private uh, state, on-chain private state, or private transactions, these things that, that permission networks need in addition to the, the core uh, technology. Um, so that's just an idea of like how Ethereum is different from uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance implementation. Um, so recently, after after they uh, after Hyperledger and the EEA joined forces, uh, the EEA released their 2.0 spec, uh, which introduced the permissioning model. So that's a huge deal because prior to this, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance didn't require a permissioning model uh, to to be compliant with with their spec. So now, going forward, the two uh, groups are, are more aligned. Hyperledger being more code first, and the EEA being a standards body, uh, more spec first. So working together, we can drive progress and, and adoption of this technology uh, because we'll have more flexibility and interoperability. Um, and and uh, that has a lot of implications for various use cases, which I'll get into. But just real quick, the permissioning model has four smart contracts. Um, just to introduce that idea of uh, the participant contract, participant group contract, network, and permissioning decider. So the, the key uh, factor here is the, the permissioning decider uh, actually controls whether invited participant groups get added to the network. So participants within those groups uh, you know, make, make uh, transactions, um, but then participant groups actually uh, vote or invite new participant groups into the network, and the permissioning decider uh, approves or, or rejects those uh, invitations or approved invitations. Um, so really quick, this is the logic of a smart contract. Uh, I know I'm at Columbia Law School, so I'll just you know admit straight up, smart contracts are not smart and they're not contracts, but that's what we're calling it. Uh, so that's not what I'm here to talk about is like, oh, we're gonna change the law forever, but like, because, because people matter, like that is the most important thing. Government is not the same as governance. I, mean, I, could, I could ramble about that, but essentially, for the inputs, you got the contract ID, uh, the transaction requests, the dependencies, and the current state. Uh, it goes through the contract interpreter, uh, which in the Hyperledger context would be Burrow, an implementation of their forked permissionable smart contract interpreter, the, the EVM uh, uh, repurposed. Uh, and then the outputs, you either have an accepted or rejected uh, transaction, so that's different from a, a permissionless network. You can actually send something to uh, someone that you're Transacting with, and they can they can reject it, or they can, uh, you know that that uh, they can they can uh, communicate with you before sending the result to the rest of the network. Uh, it's not about whether they can just reject it. It's about they can say like, oh no, that's not good, like without anybody else seeing it. Um, so th there's the attestation of correctness, which is involved in the consensus algorithm, uh, and then the the state delta. If it's not accepted, you don't have a, a state delta. That's just like the change. Uh, in the current state from the input. Um, so really quick, bringing it back to the legal uh, frame of mind, we've got three important questions in the permission network context, which are, you know, who has the right to vote on the correctness of a transaction? And how is that right determined? And then what happens when that right is, is revoked? Um, you know, what is the, maybe there's arbitration involved or, or you know, some kind of legal course of action that's necessary. Um, so diving into some of the frameworks, Burrow is really uh, important in this context of the, the unification of, of uh, Hyperledger with the EEA because it is an EVM uh, fork. So they, they actually couple their EVM execution engine with the Tendermint consensus algorithm, which is 
uh, like a delegated proof of stake uh, model. Uh, and then that's uh, over an application consensus interface, the, uh, application blockchain interface. Uh, so like in Ethereum, you have ABIs, which are uh, just like application binary interfaces for contracts. Uh, so you interface with the contract, but this is actually for interfacing with a permission network. Um, so that happened in, in uh, you know, originally the Burrow uh, virtual machine was a novel concept when they first contributed it to Hyperledger, but since then, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of forks of the EVM, um, and the, the way Burrow is used is really the, the most important thing to consider. Um, so Sawtooth last year introduced the Seth transaction family, the Sawtooth Ethereum transaction family. So transaction families are just like smart contracts in Sawtooth. Um, so it's just like a, a smart contract that allows you to interact with Web3 uh, using the Seth RPC uh, like module. So that uh, in the Seth uh, transaction family you see in the top right, that's what enables you to deploy a, an EVM bytecode smart contract using Sawtooth as a framework. And, and uh, it's default permissionless. So this was the first time that Hyperledger was pushing a permissionless architecture, which is pretty cool, because uh, most people usually think about Hyperledger as the permissioned uh, blockchain ecosystem. Um, so moving on from Seth from last year, this past month, Fabric released 1.3, uh, which had some really cool uh, new features, like the identity mixer, uh, which uses zero-knowledge proofs to uh, promote uh, an identity format, which is, which is uh, anonymized. Um, and then it also, more, more relevant to this conversation is the, the support of EVM bytecode smart contracts. So now you can write contracts with Solidity or Viper, which are the two programming languages introduced by the Ethereum developer community. Um, and, and you can use those to uh, uh, imp implement uh, your own blockchain with that runtime. So you have like the, the, the Solidity uh, contract uh, running on your network, um, which is permissioned, or, or not if you don't want it to be. Um, but uh, the idea is that you don't want smart contract development, uh, you know, in the Ethereum community to be to be mutually exclusive from permission network uh, development. Um, and so, in addition to the the support for Solidity, Fabric also released an equivalent to Seth, which is called Fab3, um, where it's kind of like the at, uh, Seth RPC, actually, uh, and that allows you to interact with uh, Web3 JS. So, taking a step back from that stuff, um, you know, that's just the trajectory of Hyperledger going from permission to more permissionless and in inviting Ethereum developers into uh, the, the Hyperledger ecosystem. Um, and that resulted in some really cool uh, and, and uh, really valuable collaborations, like the Decentralized Identity Foundation which actually uh, drove adoption of the decentralized identifier standard, or the DID standard. Um, so you'll see that across both Ethereum and, uh, or the EEA and, and uh, Hyperledger's communities. Um, so that's, that's one thing. ND is the framework, but Sovereign is the first implementation of that. Uh, it's a network that provides correlation resistant pairwise pseudonymous identifiers, and, and they also have some zero-knowledge proof tools. Uh, but, you know, relevant to the, the legal uh, considerations, you know, definitely worried about privacy, uh, compliance with GDPR is on everyone's mind these days. Um, so, getting into privacy and confidentiality, you're probably familiar with how privacy is more social, it's, it's kind of fuzzy or squishy, you know, it's not really defined uh, in an objective way. Uh, but you can think about confidentiality. So that's just concerned with the enforcement of acceptable policies for who has access to what info uh, at, at what time. Um, so, you know, that, that allows participants to keep data about transactions confidential, um, including just the existence of the contract itself. Uh, they can choose when and with whom to disclose their data, which is crucial to the GDPR compliance, uh, and they can actually uh, avoid putting PII on chain entirely. Um, so you can selectively disclose parts of the data with chosen parties, obviously, 
um, your, your right to disclose it is transferred with ownership transfer. Um, and in an ideal world, we'd like to show that users can't learn that information they aren't supposed to know. And we want to do that in a, in a, a scalable, uh, secure way. Um, so here's a breakdown of how the EEA has revised their approach to private transactions. Um, and there's an interesting distinction. It's a little more technical, but just a high level. Uh, Fabric took a different approach uh, in, in uh, providing these um, private data collections as opposed to the EEA and, and their, their uh, clients. Uh, they, they've implemented uh, a more, it's like an actual definition of the private data in the transaction itself. Um, and so there's two different types, is restricted or unrestricted. So, uh, and uh, metadata, if you're not familiar, is just like data about the data, about the pay payload data. Um, so you can see that uh, you, you must not allow storage by non-participating nodes if, the, if it's restricted uh, private transactions for, and, and that's for the payload data. Um, so you see the bottom row is definitely the most important. Um, that's where the difference is. Uh, so you can see you should not allow if it's, if it's restricted and you must not allow if it's restricted payload data. Um, so the biggest advantage of this joining forces will be interoperability and that's what open source is all about, uh, I think. And, and uh, it's bringing new meaning to that word. Uh, it's actually uh, focused more on the, the operations of, of a, a tech technology stack. Um, so a business could benefit from being more transparent and sharing data with competitors uh, in various ways. So this is a new possibility that's being explored and experimented with. Um, and so Hyperledger was one of the first groups to you know, start advocating for a, a more pluralistic view on blockchain. Uh, there's a lot of maximalists, you've probably heard that term, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the blockchain space. Uh, but Hyperledger is all about, you know, uh, many, many chains. Uh, so this idea of cross-ledger transactions is really important. Um, so Quilt is a tool uh, which is used for uh, that kind of horizontal interoperability. Um, so there's, uh, I, won't, I won't go into this too much. This is all the different considerations you need to, to review uh, when, when thinking about interoperability of cross-ledger transactions. Here's other use cases for interoperability that aren't involving cross-ledger transactions. Um, so like credentials, identity, uh, merging or upgrading your, your ledger, um, logging and, and querying the chain itself. Uh, and then, so we've got, uh, you know, the transaction interoperability and smart contract interoperability as well. So finally, last two slides, big picture. The, the interoperability is really important from the developer's perspective, but how about from the, the real world perspective? I think the most important thing that Hyperledger and the, Ethereum, or the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance can do is educate the world about blockchain technology. And they've already started doing so, providing certifications and open source or open, uh, you know, these MOOCs, these massive open online classes through edX and, and other uh, providers. And then finally, governance. I think that's a big, big part of it. Will we see Ethereum uh, community members join the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee or vice versa? Uh, will they start to further join forces, not just as associate members, but actual, uh, you know, uh, unification? Um, and and that's, that's kind of where I'll leave it. Um, and throw in a plug in for the Global Forum in December. If you're interested in this stuff, you want to get involved, uh, it's a great way to, to tap into the conversations. And it's extremely open. I got interested in Hyperledger when I visited Chicago for the Hackfest a, a year and a half ago. Um, and I had the best time just listening. It's, it's, it's it, remarkable how open and welcoming the community is. And, and uh, you know, you'll have executives from IBM and Intel, you know, kind of like arguing across the room with everyone, you know, there just to witness. Um, so that's unique. I think it's, uh, you know, the reason why blockchain is, is one of the most significant open source communities out there. Um, yeah, I, I know I, I ran over a little bit, but I'd love to answer questions. I know we've got another presentation, um, and I'll be after, or I'll be around uh, afterwards if you have more. Um, so I think you. what we'll do is we'll save all the questions for a panel at the end, and we'll cool. just run straight through now. Awesome. Thanks, James.
Uh, so Scott Nicholas uh, is the next speaker. Scott uh, is the Senior Director of Strategic Programs at LF, and that means he makes projects happen at the Linux Foundation. And uh, lately, that's been the structure of the Deep Learning Foundation, which is an umbrella project for various LF AI machine learning activities. And um, Thank you. Um, I'll first start with a request for technical assistance on pulling up my slides. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm having F8. I don't see any F key. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's the, the, the early Chromebooks. Google was trying to make it almost a laptop. Uh, it's a PDF from oh, yeah. I believe it's on the screen. I just can't get access. Thank you, Evan. So as, as Evan said, I spend most of my time uh, setting up open source projects um, and supporting them once they're launched. Uh, in March of this year, we launched uh, our umbrella project for AI. Umbrella project, as Mike uh, talked to you about earlier today, is when we have a single funding effort that supports multiple technical projects in a space. Each technical project is free to have its own technical governance, its own technical roles, the OSI approved license that works for it. Um, uh, but uh, funding requests come from uh, a single a single body. Since we launched LF Deep Learning Foundation in March, I've been leading our effort in supporting that. Um, uh, Mishi asked me to come and speak to you today about open source software and why is it necessary or whether it's necessary for AI. Um, I think it's very necessary to AI for the same reasons that um, uh, it's necessary to other areas of software with a couple different kickers. So in exploring this question right now, what I'm going to do is walk through these points. Why do organizations pursue open source strategies in general? Open source AI today, where we're at. The promise of open source AI ecosystems and some personal predictions that won't be official LF predictions, but my own thinking on where things are going. All right, why do organizations go into open source? Um, there's, the way I look at this is there's three drivers, two of which are economic, um, and the third is because it's the only way. Um, the first is to reduce development costs. We often refer to this as outsourced R&D or external R&D. If everybody has to do the same thing to enable a product, we're all copying each other, maybe there's no secret sauce, Instead of all of us building an ecosystem, why don't we have some of our developers contribute to, to not an ecosystem, operating system as an example. Why don't we have some developers contribute to an operating system and we all use that as a base layer, just to give one example. Um, that takes a large amount of investment that is duplicative, reduces it, and allows each organization to focus on what they do differently, what they do unique, where they want to push their technology. Um, the other reason organizations uh, are, are getting into open source and have been getting into open source is because it enables new business opportunities. Mike talked about this morning when he talks about um, transformational projects, projects that create sales opportunities, revenue opportunities, new services that didn't exist before. In AI, we're seeing this take place uh, with respect to many different areas. Um, one that, that in LFDL, uh, we're witnessing in real time is the development of business models around AI models. How do you build AI models? What are the services that you can wrap around model construction? Can you deliver models? Can you have a free platform to deliver models and then build on a royalty scheme on top of that? Am I moving around too much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting stuff. That's all I have to say. Um, so, New business models. The third reason that we see organizations uh, um, interested in open source is because sometimes it's the only way to solve a problem. Um, the common example we use here is security. The chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Um, uh, open chain is another example of a group coming together to make the entire system um, uh, more secure. These examples port very well over to AI. Um, we see large numbers of examples of, of organizations that are taking internal um, development, they're making an open source project. Uh, the hope is they will see 
developer diversity, organizational diversity coming into the project, and something that, that would otherwise be a captured expense that they would have to bear can be a shared expense throughout the community. They can still innovate on top of that, and that's where their technical development, their R&D internally will be focused. Um, but the base layer can be a shared collaborative effort. We're not there yet. We'll, we'll talk about um, uh, we'll talk about where things are at in a moment. Um, right now, we have a lot of projects that are uh, that don't have a lot of developer diversity. They're they're heavily weighted towards a single organization, even though they are um, uh, open source. But that's a reason it applies to AI. Uh, clearly, enabling new business models. I just gave the example of the AI model itself. There's lots of other ways in which. Um, new revenue opportunities uh, for businesses are being opened up through open source collaboration in artificial intelligence. Um, and then in terms of solving problems that we can only solve together, uh, Susan Malika from IBM will be speaking next, and, and I'll tee up a little bit of this for her. They've done a lot of really interesting work in bias and AI fairness. Um, there's Unless we have a common language for talking about things like data provenance, um, we won't be able to understand weaknesses and limitations that might be present in the model. Uh, and so together, working in a collaborative open source and open standards environment, we have the ability uh, to address those issues. So open source today, we see significant fragmentation. I'll have a slide on this in a second. High proportion of projects with primarily one organizational backer. Uh, Code is often developed internally and then is, is uh, to support, in many cases, a product or service offering and then is open sourced. Um, that's not atypical to AI. I think a lot of things start out that way. Um, oftentimes, projects are highly speciali specialized for performance of specific tasks. Not a lot of contributor cross-pollination among projects. That's something that Elf Deep Learning Foundation is specifically focused on, not just on the three projects that it's, it currently has, but across the broader space. Um, projects are, are often tightly coupled with original authors, uh, fast release cycles, and significant interest from academic institutions. Fragmentation. These are just frameworks, um, deep learning frameworks, and it's not an exhaustive list. It's a partial list. Um, there is a, a duplication of efforts right now, and that's okay. Fragmentation in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Over time, through working together, through having these projects coordinate with each other, they can begin to focus on areas where they excel. And one of the promise of, of open source collaboration uh, is to reduce fragmentation and waste. So all of the traditional reasons for developing open source ecosystems apply to artificial intelligence. Reduce fragmentation, reduced waste, um, the waste reduction isn't just across open source projects, but it's also from an internal R&D development perspective. Allow projects to specialize on their core strengths and go upstream for secondary to the project um, functionality and components and enable new business models. And a couple additional reasons that I've touched on briefly, but to sum up as to uh, why the open source software model is, is particularly valuable for AI. It allows us to address uh, Bebo. Bias in is bias out. Garbage in is garbage out. If you have 10 models for assessing um, your data, and they're all stacked on top of each other, one is pulling out people in a video stream, the other is looking at faces. If you have bias that creeps into one of those bottom layers, you have the entire analysis chain out of alignment with what you're trying to solve. Um, we need to share the context of training data. We need to share what it means to have a model trained in a particular circumstance. And data is a key ingredient. That requires cleaning, sorting, tagging, and provenance tracking of data, all things that we're familiar with from an open source perspective. Um, in terms of where did this code come from? We have to ask the same questions with respect to data. I will close with personal predictions. We will see increasing coordination across these projects. Fragmentation will be reduced through collaboration in both open source and open standards efforts. 
Dominant over pro owner projects over time will migrate towards community governance. We will see the emergence of data curation projects. Community focus will, uh, the community will focus on AI fairness and bias. And um, competitive dominance will not just be driven by the technology, but also access to data. And thank you. I'm professionally happy that people are speaking rapidly, you understand, because it's making it easier for us to keep the time, but it isn't increasing the clarity with which we are letting these themes emerge. So soon, I hope, everybody will see that all this uh, adds up to one thing and not just to three things done rapidly. Susan Malaika, who uh, I think is going to put it all together for us, um, is uh, Senior Technical Staff in IBM's Digital Business Group. Um, and a person whose work is uh, causing more open source contributions to occur at IBM. A very important job I, 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 I honor and uh, admire immensely. She works on data governance matters mostly now, which brings us to the subject of the day as far as I'm concerned in this panel, which is how to understand the complexity of all the data that we generate and all the things that we do with it. Susan, I leave it to you. Thank you, thank you. Now, could I have some technical assistance here with a laptop? Um, I'll just uh, try and even tie things together a little bit even before I uh, begin on my formal presentation. I only just realized kind of a day ago that there was Hyperledger as well as AI in the same session. So I, w I will mention that I, I do actually run hackathons, that's one of the things that I do, and I've, I've run a number of Hyperledger hackathons, and, and, and just to put it into context, um, uh, I, I've also run them in the Middle East um, with refugees, for example, and just to give you an idea of the use cases for Hyperledger, they may not be exactly what you might expect, um, so people came up with using a blockchain to manage their documents, their personal documents. As refugees, they lose all their, all their materials and so on. And so it's not just about finance, but it's about things as well ma and managing things. Another example was organs, managing donations of human organs through blockchain. So just to give you, you know, just to give you a little idea of, of some of the activities that come out of Hyperledger, um, not, they're not just related to business. Um, or finance. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I was recently in Delhi at the Freight Forwarders uh, a, a professional association, a global association. Freight forwarders are the people who fill in all the um, ships and containers, but they're not the people who manage the containers, they're the people who, who fill them. And, and they specifically asked for a talk on AI and blockchain. And that's what we, we covered, the two topics together which was blockchain as the underlying infrastructure for the, for the freight and the managing of the freight and then AI systems sitting on top of the, of the, of the blockchain-based transactional systems. So, so the, two technolo the two technologies do work together and um, you can Google me, um, uh, my, my um, Twitter handle is up there, Sumalaika, I tweeted out my slides from uh, that session as well. So relating Hyperledger and um, AI together. Um, and also just to, um, to tie in also a little bit with Scott, uh, the frequency and um, the amount of open source contributions and consumption at IBM has grown so hugely in the last couple of years that we've had to automate the processes. So it, it, the, most of the approvals are automated now. There's no meeting to discuss whether we're going to contribute or we're go, you know, how we're going to consume. There's a certain parameters now that we have. It's only then that we would actually do a human review. The, the reviews now are actually programmatic because, and we have a whole explanation and presentation that we could give about how we've automated our open source activities inside the company. Now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about um, AI and uh, let's see, do I just press, what shall I, pr page down, right. So uh, um, 
AI um, is, uh, uh, has caused various predictions, as the one that happened in Wired magazine a couple of years ago, no more coding. Um, it's, it's all going to be training. You're going to train uh, software like you train a dog. Uh, they, and uh, that, that's, that's what the article goes into. And, and, so, and what you use for training is data. And that, that's the food to, that you give the dog. Um, and uh, so on the, on the left-hand side of the slide, we see um, the various categories and the terms that people use. So artificial intelligence is, is the overall term that people use for uh, doing, uh, predicting, for analyzing the past in order to predict the future, which is net, netting, netting it out. So you give, you give the system data and it uses reasoning, machine learning and various techniques to, to predict the future. So that's the overarching uh, category, artificial intelligence. And within that, there's something called machine learning, which is quite well established. And uh, what that is, is a human decides what features you're going to, which of that are important uh, to, to, to analyze from the past in order to predict the future. It, uh, it, the human says, okay, I think age and gender are important to predict whatever. So these are the, these are the, this is the data that I'm going to, I'm going to analyze those particular characteristics in order to predict something. And then the software starts doing the uh, predictions and eats up the data and uh, focusing on those two features. And then there's something called deep learning where the software itself doesn't rely on a human to identify the features. It just it, this, the software decides. It's, it's, given, it's given information saying this, this, um, these, the, this, this person behaved, uh, or this is the classic example is, this is a photo of a cat, this isn't a photo of a cat. And you, and you uh, keep feeding the, the, the deep learning neural network pictures of cats and non-cats, and then it starts understanding how to identify a cat without you needing to tell it that a cat has two ears and, and, and some eyes and so on. So um, those are the, the sort of categories of uh, uh, the broad brush categories in AI, and deep learning is the part that's really uh, sort of attracted the attention, and every, that's what people are focusing on, and a lot of the frameworks that um, Scott showed earlier, PyTorch, TensorFlow, that's, that's what they do. They do the deep learning. They, they decide what's important, the software decides, and that from, from whatever it's fed, and then and starts making predictions from the past. So, so, so the reason um, it was, Wired was saying it's the end of code, or the, uh, the person who wrote the article, was because what you do now is you just, you just give another data set to, to one of these frameworks and it starts predicting something. You don't need to, to reprogram. You just take, take one of these frameworks or you take a model that somebody's already trained. A model is a mix of some data and some rules, some parameters that we define to actually, uh, uh, that, were, that made it good. The software actually was able to predict distinguished cats from other things easily. So that you make a model. This is a model that predicts cats from photographs. And, and then you take that model and maybe adapt it a bit to, to work on something else. So, so what's happening is people aren't just sharing code anymore. That, I mean, they continue to share code, but they also share data. And so uh, one of the renowned places to go and look for data sets is Kaggle which is a contest that people participate in um, and, uh, and it's based, you know, and there's many data sets and you go in and you take that data set and participate in a competition that's focused on a particular data set and then you get ranked um, at the end. And, uh, and so that's, that's a place where you can find data sets. However, the, um, and there's lots of other places, governments open, have open data sets uh, and the licensing of data sets is, isn't particularly clear and how you collaborate on data sets. But there is a license that came out, I think, about a year ago, the Community Data License Agreement from the Linux Foundation, which I've put on the top right on the slide. And that may be a place to start um, looking and exploring how to 
um, licensed data sets so that it can be shared properly. Um, model marketplaces is a, another area, um, and I'll, ha I'll have a couple on the next slide. So people are putting models in, and, and you can go in, 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 a, in a marketplace on, on, and you can go and, and download a, a model and use it as a basis for a, an application that requires some element of prediction. And licensing, again, for models is not, not very clear either. That's another new area. So what does it take to trust a decision made by a machine? Um, some of the questions you may want to ask, uh, like, is it fair? And there's been a lot in the press the last uh, couple of years about very poor predictions because of very poor data sets that the software was trained on. And because the, if, it were, if it was pictures of people, only certain kinds of people were, were, were included in the training data set. And then so it didn't know how to identify people from different ethnicities, for example. It, it didn't know that that was a person. Um, is it easy to understand? Can it explain itself? Last night I was at a meetup, um, which was a panel around AI. And there were experts who built models on that panel. And they all said they could not, they are the experts, but they don't know what their model, how it's, how it's actually making predictions. They, they can't explain. Uh, you know, they train it and so on, but then, and they, but then it starts making predictions and they wouldn't be able to explain it. So, so somehow we need to <laughs> um, factor that in maybe when, when, we're, when we're working in this area. It's, it's becoming very difficult as, as the area becomes more complex to, to know why certain things are predict, being predicted. And did anyone tamper with it? So it's possible to go in and let's say the software that predicts uh, a, a cat in a photo, you, you, you can mess with it, you can mess with the photos, so you give it pictures of cats, but you, you mess with the photo a little bit, or and with the input, and it could say it isn't a cat. Um, and that's a known way of, of tampering with an with a, with a, with a, AI system. So, just to um, summarize uh, some projects which are available now um, uh, that we're working on and be delighted if more people joined us. <laughs> and um, one is the project Egeria, which is a project at the Linux Foundation. And it's all about sharing metadata across tools. And so there've been many attempts in the past to, to do, um, to sort of harmonize metadata, especially in companies. Metadata, as was said earlier, is data about data. And um, like uh, when you have photos, photos have descriptions in your phone. Uh, when you take a photo, where, where it was taken, what time it was taken, and so on. So that's, that's the metadata for the photo. Um, and and there have been many attempts over the years to, to deal with metadata, and they've all failed. This project is taking a slightly different approach in that what it's saying is we don't need to identify a single place to store uh, the metadata. It's identifying a way that metadata can be shared. That's what it's focusing on. So different tools can share their metadata and ask other tools, uh, oh, do you have information about this characteristic? Please, please, please tell me about it. So Egeria, she's a, she's a goddess, a goddess of wisdom. And that's the, the name of the, of the, of the, it's a fairly new project and love, love for people to join. Another couple of projects that have been released the last six months from IBM, one is Adversarial Robustness Toolkit. And that's, that's a toolkit that helps you understand and, and your AI system, the places, the weak points where people can come in and tamper. So you, you remember I said like, you could, you could tamper with a system so it stopped actually recognizing cats properly. And this is, this is a, a set of tools, the Robustness Toolkit, to help you understand the points wh where your system may be a little weak. Uh, similarly, with the AI Fairness Toolkit, uh, the AI Fairness 360, it's, it's also um, providing a, a tool set to help you understand if you have biases in your input data set 
or any, anywhere along the pipeline. The pipeline in AI is usually the data collection phase, the building of the classifier, the thing that says, is it a cat, is it not a cat, and then, and then the prediction. So it, it, has, it, it, will, it, will, it has pieces of tools, the AI FNS 360, at every stage to help you understand whether you've got biases. And then in, in, your, in, your, in your pipeline. And then finally, I'd just like to mention something called fa Fact Sheets for AI Services. This is a paper which has been submitted to a conference um, with the idea that um, just like you have nutrition labels on food, on AI systems, you'd have something similar, which would be, uh, which would, you, the, the provider of the AI system would answer a certain set of questions. So this is early days, but um, I've put link, um, I'll tweet these slides out in a moment. I've put links to all the things I've talked about. And, um, and on Wednesday um, in New York, we're running a meetup, specifically, uh, hands-on, specifically around the AI fairness. Uh, 360 toolkit. So just either look at my Twitter, Sumalaika, or uh, Big Data Developers NYC. I also have, like like this gentleman here, have a, uh, also run run a meetup too here in New York. Anyway, thank you all very much. I'm I'm done. Uh, I hope I satisfied. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, Scott, James, you want to come up and we'll try and make some conversation for people. So, let me see if I can ask the dumb question that will at least get us started. The, the reason that we need open source is that the complexity of the software development we are pursuing is so great that it could not be done any other way, right? There's no organization in the world that could manage 11 million lines of code generated over eight months. There's no possible way that we could understand how machine learning systems work given that their architects can't understand them because all they do is they throw neural nets together in a cookbook and stuff comes out. Um, there's no way that all these projects could manage that reduction of fragmentation that you're talking about unless they could all see one another's code and understand what the common denominators were in their technical approaches. Uh, we'd lose our minds if we didn't have open source. Is that right? Go ahead. I, I believe so. Uh, and hey, all right. I just want to echo two points they made because uh, it's all about the training data in this context. You know, you got to uh, be more transparent with the context of that data. You mentioned that, that point. Uh, so it's not just about sharing the code, but also sharing the information you collect. Uh, it's a big part of open source these days. Um, one, one, reason, uh, one reason for open source could be that you need more people working on on the software in order to make progress because it is complicated. But the other is that but through open source, you get a bigger ecosystem. So you get, you, open source attracts more people. And if you, if you do it in-house, closed source, you can never keep up. So that's, that's the um, other, other aspect. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, that gets us the first point, which is that we're showing people the code because we wouldn't be able to manage all the code, we wouldn't be able to keep our levels of technical progress up, and because the code doesn't matter very much because it's all in the data. And this, of course, raises another question. I keep saying every year, come back to the conference next year, we're going to talk about machine learning, licensing, and free software. Um, but I keep not doing it because there's a new license every six months, but we don't actually know what the principles of data licensing ought to be yet. I think we have some ideas. Let's just try a couple of the questions which we're accustomed to with respect to code and see if we can understand the licensing of data. In the world of code, we said copyleft was required because if we didn't have copyleft, then users wouldn't have any rights. 
What is the user's rights concept in training data and the mixed provenance data sets? What rights are users of data to have in this world? I can start. Uh, I was at the same event you mentioned. You were last night. Yeah, I was, I I I was okay. sitting at the front at the <laughs> podium. <laughs> so they brought up some really interesting points, uh, and I'm probably just going to echo that you know the whole, whole time we talk here. But uh, they mentioned the, the example you brought up uh, in the context of facial recognition software. Uh, it's a question of whether you should limit the exposure to a certain ethnicity that's more prevalent in, in your market. So if, if you're Apple and you're building Face ID and you got a lot of access to white faces uh, but not other minority groups, should you limit how many, you know, uh, majority group, you know, subjects you, you analyze uh, to make it fair? So that's a really interesting question, I think, uh, you know, from a, from a, you know, capitalist perspective, they're going to say no, like, we're Apple, we're gonna you know, make it as best as possible for, for every group. Um, but does that leave you know, the minority groups at a disadvantage? I think, I think it does, and it hurts them in some ways. So it's a really important uh, consideration, and not to ramble on, but it, it, we, we mentioned the data, but I, I actually think more importantly, uh, you, you gotta be careful with your assumptions, because uh, every assumption is based on assumptions, and you can never make an, a, a fully accurate prediction. Uh, so you, you gotta you gotta be aware of that. You know, you, you don't uh, just blindly trust these algorithms. What should the rules be about when we improve or modify data to whom we have to give the improvements we have made? There's going to be a clear distinction in our world between improvements or modifications to data and arrival at inferences or predictions. People are going to try and keep inferences or predictions to themselves because they're going to make money on the basis of their predictions. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their modifications to data which help them to produce mm -hmm. those predictions are also property of the modifier. Mm -hmm. Is there a role for copyleft-like licensing for data in this world? Well, the CDLA license does have two flavors. It does have the flavor of well, if you make, you know, modify you you do give it give it back. So they they you know the the license hasn't yet taken off as far as I can tell, but that that's in there as a as a thought that there are uh, yes, these and two the flavors. Original, and the original IBM thinking about it was copyleft like licensing for data and the arrival of the permissive mm -hmm. license in mm -hmm. the in the process of license making was a little bit disquieting to me. Because in a world of permissive data licensing, we might as well not bother with licensing at all. It's just there's data out there. People make private modifications. They keep them to themselves. They have no obligations of reciprocity. And in the long run, we are left holding a lot of free software models even, but we don't know what the data is. And everybody's data is her, his, her, and its own. At that point, any conception of fairness is gone. Fairness has disappeared into proprietary control. I, I'm interested in social fairness, but I'm also interested in the general advantage that we have received from this consensus we've all arrived at about how to make software. A consensus which came in part out of the scientific method, which was a consensus about publishing and sharing data. And, and it's interesting to me that we now have to reinvent but, those yes. fundamental premises. Isn't there also a burden and a responsibility on the, on the part of the user, however, to understand what they're taking? To borrow an old telecon term, and, and this was the point that you had made um, about making assumptions about what you had, to, to borrow an old telecon term, these are not God boxes. They are not magical. They will not have the right answer. We as users must always fight the assumption that because it comes out, of, of that process, it is inherently right. We need to question the data and be part and have a voice in the communities that decide whether the community wants to have a permissive approach or the community wants to have a sharing-based approach. This was an important part of what we found ourselves doing in the early stages of the free software movement. We were changing the technical education system.
I started saying 20 years ago that free software was the greatest technical library ever created in the world because it was the only form of technical information that existed where you could go from naivete to the state of the art in anything you wanted to understand that computers could be made to do simply by reading material that everybody had. This point that you're making about having an educated understanding of what data can do and what m pattern recognition in the data can do is another example of a need to expand the educational structure of the world. So Mishi and I were talking in Bangalore a couple of years ago with the educational nonprofit of a very wealthy Indian IT billionaire, Nanda Nilakeni. And we were meeting with XSTEP to talk about the way in which XSTEP as a charity hoped to change Indian education. And I said, you know, in the 21st century, the society with the most data scientists wins. And there are a lot of people in India, and if you made all of them data scientists, mm -hmm. then you would win. And data science is much simpler to teach than complex statistics. So now what we need is for people to be able to learn data science. But of course, if you want to learn data science, you have to have data. Uh, and really, what we have to have is a socialized approach to this question. What do we know about data? How do we learn about data? How do we understand it? And we have to begin teaching people fairly young the kinds of questions that you're leading to, right? How do you know what a data set is? How do you understand its integrity? How do you understand its biases? How do you understand what will happen if it is fed into models of various kinds? Without the openness of all of this, including the copy leftness of all of this, we will not be able to keep that educational commitment because we won't have enough material for people to learn from. I have a question. So what, what do you think the tipping point, though, was for software? What made it really sort of the open source movement take off? And is there a similar thing we should be looking for with data? Uh, th that's a terrific question. I, 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 it's probably my long life with Richard Stallman. <laughs> but I would say that the tipping point was the difficulty of writing C compilers that didn't cause enormous failure. And GCC happened to be the thing which solved the problem of the awfulness of C and it pulled towards itself everybody in the world and everybody began contributing to the compiler because if the compiler wasn't perfect and if it didn't work for your operating system, then no program was reliable. So my own personal supposition, for whatever it may be mm -hmm. worth, is that the tipping point was the beauty of the multi-stage compiler and what Richard made up all by himself in the middle of his ruminations without ever having taken a compiler course. Could um, car driving be the tipping point? Well, that was part of what I was hoping <laughs> I we were yeah, going to think yeah, about with yeah. respect to the cars and every challenge that the cars mm. present. But I also think that what you've, you've said here is that we're going to use data in such complex ways. Mm. What, what Hyperledger is is the community of people replacing the database-oriented mm -hmm. enterprise software structure mm -hmm. with a whole series of new modalities of mm -hmm. what software is all coming together all at once in all the different ways that you were showing. Right? And, and, and the database was a comparatively simple way and it got built inside buildings that looked like disk drives and you know, it was an in-house kind of a thing. So the paradigm of software making came out of two or three places, an Oracle, a DB2, uh, uh, but, but now that post database structure, that way of storing data and accessing it that we are calling blockchains, all of the new paradigms of software are being constructed all at once in parallel by large numbers of people working together in a welcoming open source structure. Same thing is happening with respect to the code for pattern matching, machine learning, all the, but the data? No. Okay, yeah. so, so now we know that data is the new petroleum and now we know that making an oligopoly out of the oil business is the, is the need of a lot of very powerful people in the world. And we need a revolution about that the same way we needed a revolution mm -hmm. about free software code. That's the hypothesis. What do you think? I think data is the commodity um, and we will see 
in future years, again, back to personal predictions, the, the rise of, of very powerful players in the AI space simply by virtue of the data they can tap into. Um, but, yeah. but data has a problem, though, that maybe software didn't quite have the same problem, the problems of privacy, the problems of government uh, or entities taking control. And um, so that's, that's the other, other side of it, which maybe software didn't have so much. Indeed. Questions? Yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was really a fascinating panel that uh, really identified in the Q&A now data is the key concern and the key resource um, for the re revolution that uh, you've been describing. And as um, was pointed out, the, the other key theme of this conference is really peace. And I'm wondering if there's a stronger connection than was acknowledged so far between those two in the sense that is it possible, so that's a hypothesis, that the consensus on open source software development and big tech companies buying into that consensus is driven, has been made possible by the realization on part of these big tech companies that they will retain a comparative advantage because they have a huge advantage in terms of having access to data and are able to retain that advantage. And the um, you've mentioned data sharing, and one can think of ca use cases in which there is an incent private incentive of companies to share data, but we haven't seen that much of that. And we have um, this, this asymmetry with open data uh, initiatives in which governments um, make data available, and we have like really small cases small. of data philanthropy and the, and the data sets you mentioned that have all these flaws, of, like the Enron emails that train all these machines with um, emails that old white uh, male um, executives sent to each other. So I guess my question is, um, rather than law and privacy law being this, this uh, obstacle, obstacle in this world, um, couldn't, isn't there a strong, relatively strong case for government involvement in the sense of um, requiring data sharing from um, private actors in the form of mandatory data sharing? And in, if, if that's the idea, like, is there, can we rethink some of the legal apparatus that we have, like uh, forced data localization, not as a thing that threatens the internet, but as a data proliferation tool that is actually an equalizer for the uh, digital economy. Thank you. I'll just say really quick, it's a unique uh, you know, attribute of data is that it's non-rivalrous. Uh, but it does provide significant advantages in that competitive landscape you mentioned. So. Uh, withholding access to the, the troves of data from, from India would be a, a, a tremendous advantage uh, for, for their open source community, but it wouldn't be for the, the global open source community. I think, I think uh, it, it comes down to intentionality uh, and, and uh, you know, realizing that uh, shared goals exist and, and uh, you know, with, with a permission uh, network, you can actually uh, control what, what information you share uh, and still benefit from, from that uh, transparency. Others? Jeff. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about is if we're trying to create a community supported you know, collection of data, you know, with code, code is sticky. You know, I want to use a Linux kernel, I want to have a a kernel loadable module, there's only a certain number of ways I can do that, and I know there's lessons implications to that. Data doesn't have that. I can use data a billion different ways. I can use it for training, and then I want to add data to that, but I don't have to actually add it to the data set. I can just go the next day, train it on the new data, and there's nothing that's forcing the sharing. So how are we going to address that? More data is incrementally much more useful. It, it, it grows in the non, I would say that, that, and I'm not a data scientist, I'm an attorney, so take this with a grain of salt, but the usefulness of the data, I would posit grows non-linearly. Um, and so there's that aspect. Uh, the, 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 the other issue is, and I think this ties in somewhat to the question, we have to have a way of talking about the data. Um, and, and there needs to be not just a contribution of data, um, but we have to know how to talk about the data and how to know that we are comparing apples to apples and that 
data sets are compatible, and that's, that's an opportunity for open source collaboration. Uh, another thought could be that, okay, the, the pressure, we wouldn't be putting pressure on people making data available on its own, but the data and the model together. Uh, maybe that's uh, another way of looking at it, and so the, the, the pressure would be the, the yep. two together, and then you get the intentionality a little bit as well. We're already getting requests to include data with models. With models, yes. And so, so we're talking so on the, how the to combination might that. be the approach. And it starts with systems thinking, realizing that you're part of a bigger market. You know, there's there's information you don't have access to. You might have an advantage with with your data set, but the other data sets, data sets are out there. Um, so uh, it, it comes to a, a point where there's a group that coordinates and a group that doesn't, and they gain advantages, and that's what uh, drives adoption of, of the, the consortium model or uh, cooperative model. Oh, that wasn't an intent to talk. Well, it was. I was going to raise my hand. I, I will say that, that uh, I don't know what the points in time or what the events will be. But while Evan is obviously completely correct that the inflection point for open source software was this incredibly compelling code that came from Richard and how hard it was to build excellent code. But then there were some events in the broader community that caused companies to, to, to really uh, embrace that opportunity. And one was a weird thing called the bubble which was a time when all concerns about risk changed from concerns about the risk of, you know, f of the FUD stuff, you know, where did this come from and all this sort of stuff, to it, I, I, if I miss this window, I will miss it forever. So time became the biggest risk factor and the availability of these excellent assets became the solution to that. And that never changed. The bubble went away, a lot of stuff went away, sock puppet stopped going public, but that never went away. The second thing that happened hap was, you know, most easily described through the IBM perspective, but it really uh, it came from a lot of different places, is that, is that there was a dominant operating system and there was a position where you know, everybody else in the industry was trying to build an operating system and none of their customers cared about that operating system. And the idea from Irving Aldansky Berger was, was look at what you could do if you had one operating system throughout that went all the way from pervasive computing all the way up to supercomputers. And pervasive computing, when he said this in, what, 1999 or 2000, nobody knew that that was, that, that was cell phones. But you know, that concept that the only way to compete with complete market dominance was for everybody else in the market to build a single solution um, was very important. And that idea of what was possible if they did that was very important. And the, the piece on the data that has some possibility, I think, of being relevant is that we will have companies with, um, with very dominant positions on data, and they will have a fear of what will happen if, the, if uh, that position becomes so strong that regulation is absolutely required. And I think you will see public-private partnerships emerge because they will um, see that if everybody else gets on the other side, that that market dominance could be altered. And, uh, and so they, they either want to be riding that wave or not. I don't know what's going to happen, but I... But I'm going to give you the last word about that because I think that's a good place yeah, to stop, actually, because I need to kick everybody else off using organizers' privilege so that I can do a little talking myself. Thank you all very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you.